to asking questions. We're going to look at asking questions now. Uh, within the word question is the word quest. Kind of lame, but it's in there. A quest is a longer, arduous search for something. You are on a quest when you're asking questions. And of course, answering those questions is a long and arduous search for the answer. <clears throat> so, while it, as you've all already stated, while you're doing observations, it's driving questions. Okay, you, you're looking at things and you start to have questions in your mind. Questions beg to be answered and the, the difficulty is trying not to answer them at the time that you're doing the observation. Very difficult task. You can answer them, but you have to ask them first. And therefore you ask questions about everything that you see that you don't understand. If you don't understand something, you ask the question. No matter how elementary you think you look, ask the question. I don't know, what, that, what does that word mean? That's a fine question. You can look up in a dictionary and find out what that word means. Or what is this concept? Well, you can look it up <clears throat> in a Bible dictionary and find out what that concept means. But you have to ask the question first. Don't go forward without asking the question if you have one. If you don't have one, try to look for some. Our questions are the primer for interpretation. By asking a question, the question needs to be answered. You know, what does this mean is the question for interpretation, as Hendrix puts it in there. Uh, but you ask all these questions, you are getting at what is the interpretation, but you have to ask the questions first. How many observations were enough for one verse? Well, Hendrix says the more work you put into observation, the less work you have to do for interpretation. Right because you have observed there are so many questions you can answer just through observation. We'll look at that later. But how many were enough? I can't have going and going and going for some Yeah, you could. Same thing is true for how many questions for one verse. You could come up with all sorts of questions. I am not in any way trying to get you to ask questions about things that you already understand. What does the word the mean? What does the word at mean? And then you have to write this long explanation. At is a preposition. That means. Okay? So, but ask questions of things you really don't understand. Who, what, when, where, why, how your way through scripture. Remember that poem from last time by Rudyard Kipling about his six helping friends? Uh, taught him everything he knew. So you ask these questions as you go through scripture. Uh, it, it helps you to understand it, because when you ask the questions, then you won't have to answer the questions. In which areas can you ask them? And you, you can ask grammar questions. Grammar questions are great. Ask questions about names and people and places. History, culture, anything that you don't understand, you should ask questions about. Anything. Let's look at some examples. <clears throat> grammar questions. What does this word mean? How many words are there in the English language? Nobody knows what they all mean, except for the dictionary, Mr. Dictionary. Come in, Mr. Dictionary. No. <laughs> Hi, boys and girls. <laughs> now to recite the whole dictionary. I think mean, Siri does. Oh. Why you had to bring up Siri? We're yeah. having a good time over here. You should ask Siri. <laughs> what does the word mean? What is the function of that word? How is it used? What's the function of this word? What is that punctuation used for? I don't understand that punctuation. Who is doing the action in this sentence? Who is receiving the benefit of this sentence? How long does this action last? Remember the verbs? These are good questions. Okay. You ask these types of questions, etc. Whatever question you have about the grammar, ask it. You who? Who is the you that the you is referring to? Right? You is the second person pronoun. And it can be singular or plural. In, in English, it's the singular is you. Plural is yeah, Philemon, and that was really tricky because it's written to Philemon, but he names off all those other people. But then, then here I was like, okay, who is you? And then down here, no, it was specifically Philemon. So it's like he's writing it to all these people, but it's Philemon. So I mean, yeah, that was a big thing. And you can be tricky in Philemon yeah. because in English the singular is you, and and the plural is you. Do you hear the difference? Yeah, if you're southern, they'd have y'all. Yeah. Okay, we need a southern version of the Bible, one that says y'all. 
because we understand what y'all is. I mean, I'm serious. This is this is just foolishness mm -hmm. in the English language that we have the singular and plural as the same. So in the Greek and Hebrew Aramaic, they had specific words of, for you that meant plural. Y'all. Yo, yo, ye. I the concordance. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I put up know. you in the concordance, I should have bought mine. I have a uh, lexicon for you if you'd like. Uh, do you see the difference? No, nobody sees the difference. So it's confusing, and you have to get to the bottom of who is the you that he's talking to, because it creates uh, real issues. Jesus says in Matthew 16, he's talking. Who do the he's talking to his disciples? Who do they say? Uh, who do people say that I am? Or who do you say that I am? And he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <laughs> the question is, who is the you that Jesus is talking to? I need context for that. You better believe it, but who is the you? We're going to answer this in the next section. So isn't that observation, though, to actually go to Strong's or whatever you sort and to say, okay, I'm going to just look up the word? Because wouldn't they have known? Like, For us, this, yeah, they would have known. But back then, they would have known when yeah. you used that word. So it really is an observation to like under, go back and understand the language. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, that would be that would be fair. But it would be best maybe at that point just to put it as a question. I'm actually uh, going to answer okay. this for you okay. later, and I'm going to give you a little okay. guide to understanding who the you is. Uh, grammar is important and words mean something. We don't get to decide what they mean. We don't get to decide their function. Their meaning is the meaning in the context. Their function is the function within the context. You, that's y'all, don't get to decide what the words mean. You, that's y'all, get to discover what they mean. Okay. Uh, questions on names, people, and places. Who are these people? What is the name of... Why is that name important? What is the meaning of this name? How many different names does this person have? <laughs> it's Nimrod. His, his name is Rebel, but what's his real name? Uh, <clears throat> is that name also a place? Is this person's name also referring to a place? Where is it located? What's the significance of that river? How many names does that place have? Oh my goodness, this is a big one. How many names does that place have? How many names does that king have? How many names does that pharaoh have? Uh, what is the climate like? What's the physical climate like? What's the topography of that area? Is it hilly? Is it flat? What is it? And what is the geology below the surface? The Bible says that in the future there's going to be a massive earthquake in the Mount of Olives. Guess what we found out? Yeah, they've shot the seismic. There's a, underneath a fault line that goes, a very big one that goes up the Jordan. And it spines, spines off into the Mount of Olives area and into Jerusalem. Yeah, there's going to be a massive earthquake in the future. We now know. Pretty cool. Uh, who are all the people in Genesis 10? Here's a good question. Uh, who are these people? Who are all these people in Genesis 10? Anybody know who these three are? Um, oh, is that what the naked is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, the naked. I kind of tried to crop the naked guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You've got Shem and or, yeah, Japheth, or Japheth and Shem that are, they look like they're doing a Greek dance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I thought they were doing. And, and there's Ham. Oh. But the question is, who are all these people that are mentioned that come from these three guys? <clears throat> Did you have a question? Here's another one about a place. Uh, the plague of hail and storm that, that happens in Egypt, one of the, the plagues of Egypt in Exodus 9. Pharaoh says, there has calls Moses and Aaron in. There's been enough of God's thunder and hail. And he's really upset about the thunder as well. He mentions it. Why is Pharaoh so sick of thunder? It's important. We'll answer all these later. Uh, questions about history. What happened with this particular empire, right? What type of chariots did they use? The specific people were the Egyptian chariots the same as the Philistines chariots the same as the Israelites chariots the same as the Assyrians, etc., etc., etc. Are there any primary sources or ancient historians that record this event? Whatever the event may be. 
what was going on in the region at this time, who were the big players in the world stage at that time, how did that nation fall, what were the circumstances, good case study, the Assyrians at Jerusalem, 185,000 Assyrians are killed in one night. And we get that story in Isaiah, also in 2 Kings 18, chapters 18 through 19. Rav Sheka and Sennacherib. Rav Sheka was his general at the gates of Jerusalem. Is there any historical proof that this event happened? You apparently have a photo. Yeah, because <laughs> this is, this is a photo. <laughs> that is Rav Sheka. <laughs> it's kind of blurry though, because I took it on an iPhone. Yeah, well, actually, you were close. It was a Polaroid. Oh, it was a Polaroid. <laughs> a Polaroid. Remember the Polaroid? Yeah, it had to go like this. <laughs> Culture questions. Why do they do that? Well, what do they value? What do they hate? What do they love? Uh, how do they respond to that type of thing? What's acceptable to them? What type of clothing do they wear? What government style do they prefer? Or do they have? Who rules in that government? King? Is it a group? Is, is this a regional governor we're talking about? All these questions. Uh, cutting a covenant in Genesis 15. Why did God have Abraham slice animals in half? What in the world is going on here? It's crazy. It's crazy. Now, I want to answer that one. Here they are. That's the scene. Now that was with the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, all these questions, the, the point is this, and I, these aren't the only questions, right? Mm -hmm. You can ask all sorts of questions. So what I want you to do for the remainder of the time, spend the rest of the time just writing down the questions that you have for Titus. Start in chapter 1, go as far as you can. We're, since we haven't asked questions of Titus yet, we're going to ask questions. If you only do chapter 1, that's fine. Just go as far as you can. You can work alone or in groups. Okay. And then we'll share our findings in the last few minutes.